Hey friends, it's Jara. Welcome back to my channel. Truthfully, I'm feeling very nervous about this video. I have been avoiding it for a while now, but I feel like God has laid it on my heart and hopefully I can get through it today and be able to get it done. But So for some backstory, I filmed my testimony video in 2020 and I shared some of my story, but there was a big piece of my story that I left out um, that included like my upbringing and a lot of things that affected my testimony and my faith and stuff like that because I was too scared to mention it. Um, also because... I had just left this denomination that year, earlier that year, so it was still like very fresh um, and I was still healing and had a lot to figure out and to learn. So I never mentioned it then because I was afraid. I also just didn't feel like the right time, but over the past, going on three years now since it's 2023, I feel like God has like kind of been preparing my heart and I've learned a lot and feel like especially lately the past few months, he's been putting it on my heart that it's time for me to share this side of my story, which is scary to me. Um, because the whole reason why I have been hesitant to share this is because I never want to bring other people down or offend people or give people a reason to want to argue with me and bring me down or whatever it might be. And it's just scary. I don't like conflict. I don't like a lot of the, that type of stuff. So I've been avoiding it. <laughs> but if you watch my testimony video, I said right before my testimony, I felt the same way and I like avoided making my testimony video over and over again. But God just kept putting it on my heart until I did it. And then I felt such a relief. So that's how I've been feeling now. So I hope after I finish this, I'll feel a big relief. <laughs> but Pretty much today I'm going to be talking about my experience um, growing up in the Pentecostal religion or denomination, however we want to word it, and leaving Pentecostalism. So yeah, I'm going to be going over a few different topics during this. Um, let me just do a disclaimer that if you are coming into this video and you're pretty much just like looking for a reason to be triggered or upset or to argue with me, please do not watch my video. That's not why I'm uploading this. I'm not here to degrade anybody or bring anybody down. And I'm also not saying that my opinions on this or my experience is what everybody believes or everyone's experience. I'm just here to share my side of, you know, my story on this. And I'm not here to bash Pentecostalism or anything like that. I'm just here to you know, share my story. So please do not watch the video if you're here to <laughs> be hateful or you just want to get angry about my opinions. Okay. Okay. So I wanted to start off with just kind of an overview of how I was raised um, and the kind of core beliefs in our doctrine that we really like focused on. One of the biggest things was the belief in the Trinity, um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that belief. Another one that was a big thing is I feel like the belief of like speaking in tongues was hold was held in a very high regard. So I don't think that really I was taught that you had to speak in tongues to be saved, but they kind of like believed where if you were saved and you're not speaking in tongues yet, like there's something wrong or you're there's a concern or your heart isn't right or something like that. So there was like a very big belief in speaking in tongues and that was something that was preached on a lot in sermons and things like that. Another big belief that we were taught is that you're supposed to be separate from the world. So we kind of took that in, I would say an extreme with the way we would dress and stuff. They would want other people to be able to look at you and say, oh, they're a Christian, like they're different. They go to a church somewhere like, you're supposed to look very different from the world. This also goes along lines with like um, the way you speak, the music you listen to, movies you watch, 
don't drink alcohol, you know, things like that. Another belief um, was that salvation did come through Jesus and through God, but in my opinion, I believe that there was kind of another layer to that where in order to kind of keep your salvation and stay a Christian, you needed to do all this other stuff. And if you didn't do all this other stuff, your salvation could easily slip away. You would need to like repent and become born again, again, to get your salvation back from, you know, messing up on these rules, if that makes sense. Something else that was a big thing that I was taught that I think is kind of like a fear tactic almost to making everyone stay in this denomination is the teaching of like backsliders. So pretty much we were taught that anyone who left the church and no longer went to the Pentecostal church, they lived their life differently. They didn't go according to the rules, whatever. They were then a backslider and they were no longer saved or no longer in the place with God where they should be, that type of teaching. Um, so it was kind of like, I used to ask questions when I was younger, like, okay, well, what if someone never like knew about Pentecostalism and they were never taught the right way, you know? And I would, I was told like, well then, you know, maybe they can get into heaven because they were never shown the full truth. But if you've been shown the truth and then you leave, then you're a backslider and could go to hell because you were shown the truth and now you're rejecting the truth, you know? Okay. So there's probably a lot more um, beliefs that's grounded in this denomination. Those were just kind of the ones that came to mind whenever I thought about how I grew up. Um, to give you some background, I was born into this denomination and I left when I was 18 years old. So I was in this for a long time, <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm an expert at all. It's just, just speaking about what I remember, you know? Next, I wanted to go into some of the rules or guidelines that we were taught to live by. Now, when I say rules, I don't mean that when you went into church, there was like a list on the wall and every day you'd look at it and make sure you're following them. They were, they weren't unspoken rules. They were very spoken and very like talked about and enforced, but I'm sure a lot of them wouldn't refer to it as rules. They would just say it's a standard they live by. Biggest thing for women, I made, a, I made a woman's list and a men's list. I can speak more about the woman's list because that's what I had to live by. But for the men's list, I just kind of observed what I, you know, saw. For women, one of the biggest things is you can only wear skirts or dresses. No pants, no shorts, leggings, things like that. Um, I did wear like shorts and like pajama pants at home. I would get that question. Sometimes people would be like, do you wear skirts at home too? No, I wouldn't. Um, but only dresses. Um, also no swimsuits, by the way, this is kind of a side note because I forgot to write that down. Um, you couldn't wear swimsuits. You would have to wear um, dresses to swim in. Or if you were a little bit like looser or not as strict as some, you could wear like men's swimming trunks because they're longer and looser to swim in and like a t-shirt with like swimsuit underneath it. If that makes sense. Um, anyway. Only skirts, skirts had to always go below the knee. The knee was one of the big, like, I don't know what you would say, like a boundary or whatever you wanna say, like that's where the skirt always had to hit. For some um, who were stricter, so there's kind of different levels of Pentecostalism. For us specifically, we weren't what you would call holiness. That's a little bit even more stricter than what we believed. But for holiness people, some of them believe you have to wear your dresses all the way to the ground. For us, it was below the knee. Um, and let me also say, I'm not going to go into a deep study on each of these topics for this video because it would be very, very long. But if you guys do want a biblical study on these different standards and what I believe now and kind of what I found in the Bible about this stuff, I would be happy to do that. Um, just let me know which parts you want to see a separate video on. I am going to leave a few things linked below, some videos and stuff like that that really helped me and kind of go into um, a deeper dive of like studies um, if you guys do want to check those out. But pretty much their whole thing about women not wearing pants is based on saying that it pertains to a man, which is a verse that they use a lot. 
um, I can put it on a screen. But if you want to study on that, like I said, let me know. Um, another rule was like making sure you had a modest neckline. I specifically remember in church camps, they would have a rule where you would have to take your fingers and you'd have your collarbones and you would make sure it's like, I think three fingers. So I'm, I'm making the cut today. I'm pretty modest. <laughs> three fingers to your neckline is what was modest. And if it was any more than that or whatever, it was immodest. Um, you couldn't wear anything sleeveless. So you couldn't wear like tank tops, straps, anything like that. You would always have to wear sleeves. Um, even a cap sleeve, which is just like a really short sleeve, sometimes they'd be like, you're kind of pushing it. Um, and then I believe the holiness side of it, which is the stricter side, they believe you have to cover your elbow too. So knees and elbows, that's the thing. Um, you always had to wear loose skirts or dresses. You could not wear anything fitted. You can't show like the shape of your body at all. Um, I literally have an image in my mind. I specifically remember a church camp I went to when I was a kid and in the girls' dorms, they had a diagram on the wall that showed a woman um, in like, I don't remember how many dresses it was, like four or five different dresses, like a diagram. And in each one, she would be wearing a different fitted dress. Like it's the same dress, but it's getting tighter and tighter. So it started off and be like, this is modest. This is okay. This is really loose. Still modest, kind of pushing it. Not modest, definitely not modest. So it was like a guideline to remind yourself before, I think I remember them telling us, a counselor told us before you go to church service, stop by and look at that guideline and make sure that you are modest <laughs> according to this um, drawing, okay? Another big thing was like no makeup, no nail polish, no um, ear piercings or tattoos or um, jewelry at all for some of their beliefs. I was raised where you could wear wedding rings, but that was kind of it. But all of that kind of stems from, I think the piercings and the tattoos thing is kind of a separate thing because there's still some Christians who aren't Pentecostal who hold that belief tightly. Um, personally, I don't believe there's anything wrong with piercings or tattoos. That's a whole separate study in itself. But with the makeup, nail polishes and jewelry, the big grip on that was like vanity and you didn't want to have vanity, which to me is just crazy, like the hypocrisy in it because for the girls I specifically remember, there was like big trendy stuff um, for clothes. I felt like every church camp I would go to and service was like a fashion show almost. You wanted to make sure you had like the most beautiful dress and there were specific types of dresses and specific brands that were very expensive dresses like over a hundred dollars for like a church dress and if you had that you kind of showed off like your money almost or specific handbags like a coach bag or a michael kors bag or whatever watches and the guys would wear fancy suits so i'm like the vanity thing's kind of crazy to me because you can't paint your nails or wear jewelry because it's vanity but that part of showing wealth in your own way, but because it's modest, it's fine. You know what I mean? Like that's a big hypocrisy to me. Big thing on nail polish that I heard growing up that was wild to me is I heard someone say, you can't paint your nails because that's what, how, what word should I use? Um, street workers would wear back in the day to attract customers. That's wild. And also, that's not true. Um, that's not the origin of nail polish. I think one of the first um, origins I found from it was in like Egypt, they would wear nail polish to show what um, status or class they were at ranking in the society. So again, that's like a whole separate study, but that's not true either. <laughs> one of the biggest things that Pentecostal people are known by is their extremely long hair. Um, you're taught not to cut your hair. Some of them, like us, we could trim it a tiny bit to like keep it healthy, but some of them can't cut your hair at all. Their hair is to the ground. I had very long hair for most of my life until, you know, a few years ago when I left and I did trim it, but I didn't, you know, have any big chops until later on. Um, you also couldn't dye your hair because that's not how your hair was given to you when you were born so you're changing how God gave it to you but the hypocrisy on that to me which is wild is that perms are a big thing so it's hard to upkeep how long your hair is and you don't want to do it all the time or curl it all the time because it's so long 
So a lot of women would get perms where they would make their hair curly. And it's crazy to me because a perm is literally permanently changing the structure of your hair. So you weren't born that way. God didn't give you your hair that way, but you're gonna permanently change it, but that's different from dyeing your hair. And literally perms are like a huge thing for like the pastor's wives, everybody would have a perm. Don't ask me, I don't know how that makes sense. Um, and then another one is no secular music or movies. These are the main ones that I could remember. Um, I'm sure there's some different ones that I've forgotten, but these are the ones that came to my mind. And then those were all the women's rules, right? For the men, um, they weren't allowed to wear any shorts, which was kind of weird to me because um, if women could wear dresses right below their knee, I never understood why guys couldn't just wear sh shorts below their knee. So these poor guys, like in this hot summertime at camps would have to be wearing like pants like denim or those little swishy pants you know to play basketball and stuff like that and I would always feel kind of bad for them not gonna lie um they have to keep their hair short like if you are growing out your hair as a guy it's like seen as rebellion or something and also you shouldn't have any facial hair a lot of these are just very confusing to me because they're not biblical at all especially with like men can't have their hair long or they can't have facial hair like that makes no sense to me also something else i wanted to say that was wild is with them saying like you can't change your natural appearance is that they never said that about women shaving their legs <laughs> you know like it's encouraged to shave your legs and be ladylike but you're you know cutting off your leg hair to appear feminine or whatever you want to call it and when I asked about that, I was told that's because that's personal hygiene, which it's not, it's just a societal standard. Um, so I can cut off the hair on my legs, but not the hair on my head, because that makes sense. Um, same for guys, they can't have piercings or tattoos. Um, also, they can't wear anything sleeveless, so no tank tops, you have to wear sleeves or cover their elbows, depending on your, you know, how strict you are, no jewelry, some of them can wear wedding rings if they believe that and also no secular music or movies. So the list difference is wild. I truly believe there was way longer of a list for women. Like if I showed you my notes, this is the women's, this is the right to there is the men's. Talk about double standards. And so that leads me into my next topic that I wanted to talk about which is something that truthfully kind of always bothered me growing up is what I believe is double standards for women. And also I think there is an underlying, how would I word this? I think there's misogyny and what I believe are rules and kind of like family structures and things like that and expectations for women that are oppressive to women, truthfully, to put it bluntly. Um, I remember being taught, a lot of my memories come from church camps and that's because growing up I went to like three or four church camps during the summertime. So I spent a lot of my life going to these church camps and we would spend about a week there at each one. So I just have a lot of memories of sermons and stuff like that. But when every time I would go to a church camp, pretty much everyone, they would have a separate men's and women's talk. And I always remember we would be told the whole, you know, guidelines um, that I just mentioned for how you're expected to dress during the week. And I remember being taught, literally, if you are dressing inappropriately um, and a boy at camp looks at you and lusts after you and in his heart, he's lusting after you and he ends up going to hell, that could be your fault because you made him lust after you. So you're putting a lot of pressure of other men's salvation and their relationship with God on these young girls from a very young age. So there's a lot of pressure to dress a certain way because it's not even just like you should do it to please God. It's also like you're putting, you know, other people's lives and their salvation on my conscience of worrying about these men now. And honestly, that belief 
is so opposite of what Jesus taught us. Like if you read Matthew 5, 27 through 30, it's literally the opposite of what I was taught about modesty and the responsibility of lust being on women. The exact opposite. Now, let me also say this. I do believe in modesty and I do dress a certain way. I also believe that there are personal convictions that come with modesty. And I think that if you live your life according to the Bible and you have a relationship with God, he will naturally convict your heart and you will naturally feel what is comfortable for you to wear and what is not comfortable for you to wear. That's how I am. Truthfully, nowadays, I don't even really think much about what I put on, if it's modest or not. If I wouldn't have bought it if I didn't feel comfortable in it. And clothing is not a huge part of my life anymore. Um, in that sense of like obsessing over modesty. I believe I dress in a modest way that I feel is comfortable to me. And if a man wants to lust after me, he's going to, whether I'm wearing a dress or I'm wearing pants. Um, again, there can be extremes to that. I don't think you need to be going out of your way to dress inappropriately, but it is a personal conviction that goes from woman to woman. And I would be happy to do a video about modesty if you guys want to see that and hear my beliefs and my studies on it. But let me just preface that. Something else I remember specifically that now when I think of it, it just makes me feel gross is I remember a counselor telling me at the age of like maybe 11 or 12 that whenever she was giving us the talk for the week about modesty, she told us that she asked a church elder at this camp if, um, I don't know if he was an old man, but he was just a grown man, I guess. She didn't tell us who, what his name was, I don't think, but she just said, she asked him if the knees, the knees thing was an actual thing that make men stumble and he said yes like let's just take a second and analyze this you're at a camp with kids ranging from the ages of like I don't know five to I don't remember at what age you have to become a counselor and you're no longer a um camper but like I would say the kids little kids, you know, five-year-old kids, all the way up to like probably 18 or so. I don't remember the cutoff age, but 95% are minors. And you're going to tell a counselor that it makes you stumble or lust if you see a little girl's knees during church. Like, <laughs> if you have people in your church who you're concerned about lusting after girls' knees, there is a deeper rooted issue here than just blaming it on the girls and saying that you need to dress a certain way so that they don't lust after you. That's all I'm gonna say about that because I'm gonna get all worked up about it because it really makes me angry. But I specifically remember that and I've never forgotten that moment when she told me that. So I think another belief that is held very strongly and Pentecostalism is the traditional like marriage roles, um, which I think there's a big emphasis on like women being submissive. And before I left and me and Richard got together and I was preparing to be married, I didn't know much about what the Bible actually said about the men and the women's roles in marriage. All I really knew about was what the women were told, which was to submit, 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 submit. And that is a big thing for these people, um, which it is important to be submissive, but I don't believe it's in the way that I was taught. And since I actually dove into the studies of biblical marriage, it's much different than what I was taught and preached at and shown, even as examples growing up and seeing couples at camps and some preachers or pastors and like, it's not what I believe is biblical. Now there is some, but personally, this is just what I think. I think also women are like very encouraged to be stay at home moms or stay at home wives. I don't think there's anything wrong with being a stay at home mom. I probably will be a stay at home mom once we're able to do that. Um, and once we have babies of our own, but it's kind of almost like they're not given much of another option. 
Um, a lot of women aren't encouraged to like go to college or be on your own. And majority of women, they don't move out of their house until they're married because it's not seen as, I don't know, appropriate to live on your own as a woman. You should be at your family's house until you get married. And then once you get married, you move with your husband, obviously, but you never have an in-between like by yourself or independent living at all. It's seen as inappropriate. So from that, it's like women just aren't given a lot of options. You're kind of just like a pastor's wife, stay-at-home mom, or some of them maybe will be a nurse or like a teacher, but it's never really encouraged to do anything outside of that. You know what I mean? It's not something preached about really, but I feel like it's just like an unspoken kind of thing within the church. A big thing that's also, I think this is something that is controversial in just Christianity in general, not specifically Pentecostalism, but I think there's some extremes to it is like divorce is never an option. Um, this is another thing I have my own personal beliefs on that I could do a study on, but there was situations where I heard stories about there being um, extreme marriage situations where either there was mental or physical abuse situations and these people would expect the wife to stay anyway. So the oppression of women right there is like very, very obvious to me, honestly, and unbiblical, you know. Um, I think another big thing that really hindered my relationship with God was like a lack of biblical teachings. I feel even to this day, like very uneducated on some topics. Um, I feel like such a focus was put on these standards and beliefs of things that there was a whole like a whole side of the Bible I was missing out on that I was never taught about fully. And so ever since I left in 2020, I've been like kind of starting over completely truthfully. I don't feel like I was actually saved until 2020 when I left and started a real relationship with God and taking time to figure out what I believed. And I'm still learning so much. I feel like I'm a brand new Christian, truthfully. Like I've only really been a full Christian, I think, in my opinion, for like three years now. So I'm really learning a lot still. Um, but because there was such a huge lacking of biblical teachings on a lot of different things, like, like I said earlier, speaking in tongues was such a big thing, but I was never really taught about the other gifts of the spirit, you know, things like that. So with that, I feel like you're missing out on a lot of like who God is and who Jesus was and like how he lived his life, things like that, where it's hard to have a relationship with God when you don't know who he is. When to me, I just felt like God was looking down on me in disappointment and anger because I kept messing up. I wasn't following these rules and he was so far away from me and I didn't know him and he was like tolerating me. He didn't love me because I was a disappointment. Like these type of weird feelings built up from, you know, not being taught who he really is and what he wants from me and what he desires from me and what salvation truly is. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention before I answer some of you guys' questions is a rough one. Um, people would probably get triggered over this. Something that I have seen in this denomination growing up is I think that there are underlying issues of racism. This religion is, or denomination, however you want to word it, is predominantly white and there was many things said that I heard growing up from authority figures from people you think that are so holy and greater than you and these things that literally made me question what type of people are they because how could you say these things about people? I don't know if I want to give examples. If you know me now, I am married to 
my amazing husband who is black and um, we got together after I left the church. But growing up when I had shown interest in black guys, um, there were things said to me from different people in my life like, why would you ever be with a black guy if you could have a white guy? Um, don't be unequally yoked. Um, your kids won't look like you if you have babies. The world is morphing you into... I don't remember the exact wording of that one. I just remember them saying something like, the world is turning you into someone else because I was interested in black guys. Then I also had heard from a huge like leadership or authority figure in my life. I heard in the room he was speaking to somebody else and he said something like, I don't even remember the conversation, but I just remember hearing him say, well, I hope I don't have any blacks in my family somewhere. So there was a lot of concerning verbiage being used that I heard growing up that made me question things. And there has been some people that are still in the denomination that I've spoken to and they admit that they do believe that there are issues. Um, I also think that there are issues of, I actually didn't write this down, I just thought of it though, but I think there are issues of holding um, political identity very highly in their church. I remember them preaching from the pulpit multiple times about political parties and um, candidates and there's a lot of, I believe, nationalism in the church in this denomination and being told that if you believe, or if you vote a certain way or whatever, then you're not a Christian and you'll go to hell. So there's a lot of messed up priorities in my opinion. Okay, so now we're going to get into the questions that you guys left me. I had a um, question bubble open on my Instagram and also on my YouTube community page. So I'm just going to answer some of those now. When did you decide to leave and what was the final straw for you? Well, without going into too much detail, because this is a private thing, um, there was a situation it was, I left in January of 2020. There was a situation that I had brought up to some of my, I would just say leadership, I guess, that I was concerned about. That leadership then brought it towards one of our other authority figures and I trusted them to handle it properly. And pretty much they swept things under the rug. They threw me under the bus. I felt so disrespected and not valued, didn't care about um, me, and I felt betrayed. I felt disrespected. And so after that day when that happened, I left and I never went back. Um, and honestly, I'm thankful for that time, even though it was a rough situation. I think God kind of worked it out where he knew I needed a push to finally be able to actually leave. And that was the push for me. Um, also, let me just say, I have had questions my whole life growing up in this. I questioned things. I was looked down on for questioning. You're never supposed to question. That's just the way it is and you just go along with it. And I'd been wanting to get out for a long time, probably since high school. I felt the, not fully, I mean, maybe my last two years, I felt the longing to be able to be free and to leave because to be honest I do feel like these this legalism was such a bondage over my life and I don't want to get emotional about it because I've made it through this video without crying but I I had been longing for a long time and whenever that happened I felt like I was finally able to walk away and start over you know, what is something that was a positive that you've carried forward into your current life? When I read this question earlier, I was like, I don't even know, <laughs> truthfully. Um, 
something positive from it. I feel like something positive I can say is just that because of this, because this was my life and the way it all played out where I left and everything, I was really able to start all over and become who I am today because I've lived through this and find a deeper meaning and studies through my true beliefs and have confidence and peace in my beliefs now. So I guess like, I don't know, I don't think I'd be who I am today if I didn't live through those experiences. And hopefully, and I know from my testimony at least, I was able to help some people who reached out to me who are still in this or they were in this denomination and they were, they felt like my story touched them. So if anything, hopefully God uses this video in some way. I mean, he's put it on my heart, so I just have to trust he has a plan for it, you know? What denomination are you now and what are your current beliefs? So I'm non-denominational. Um, I just like to say I am a believer, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ. Um, personally, I believe in the Trinity. I believe that our salvation comes from Jesus and that he's coming again, that he rose from the dead. Um, but I also don't believe that your salvation can go away so quickly. I don't think it's such a frail thing that like you sin one time and all of a sudden all of your salvation disappears and you have to start all over again. You know what I mean? And truthfully, there's still a lot to my beliefs that I am figuring out and I think there's some things that you will always be learning about that maybe we won't even understand fully until we're in heaven with God so those are my beliefs have you lost friends from moving on yes um, truthfully I lost all my friends um that's the sad reality of this I was, you're raised so like involved in this community that like all of my friends, I mean, I had friends from public school because I did go to public school. Some kids were private schooled or homeschooled and they didn't even have, you know, public school. So I did have friends from public school, but majority of my friends were from church camps, from my church, stuff like that. And once I left, um, I don't know. I feel like I just kind of started to realize like maybe we were just friends out of convenience, you know, just seeing each other. You would just be friends. And once I stopped going to those things and stopped going to camps and sermons and um, camp meetings and revivals, like you just kind of fade apart. I don't remember personally experiencing like having a big conversation about it or anything about me leaving. That's more so on like family side of stuff because all of my family most of my family are still in this denomination but for friends you know I don't feel like they were truly my friends I feel like it was just convenience was there anything that you enjoyed in Pentecostalism me and Richard talk about this sometimes um I did enjoy camp I think camp was fun I loved being in the choir and having a big group of people singing together um and I do miss the community of it, you know, like being excited to go and see everybody and the clothes was fun, you know, dressing up was fun. And I think some of that part was being prideful in me, like wanting to show off and being fashionable and having the cool friends. And it's very clicky, truthfully, very clicky. There was definitely popular kids, cool kids that you wanted to be in with, which I usually wasn't. But, you know, I did. I do miss some of that. I also miss some of the music. I did enjoy that. How has your life changed since leaving? I feel like my entire life has changed. <laughs> Truthfully, for the better. Um, in 2020, I was still figuring out a lot about myself right after I left. And I met my husband in November of 2020. We dated from November till um may of 2021 then we got engaged and then we got married in september of 2021 and so that was a big life change i think from going to, 
from going from being in the um, Pentecostal denomination, leaving, having a huge like kind of like a culture shock, I guess, of like adjusting to the outside world and like all that stuff. Um, and then just, you know, being in a relationship, getting engaged, getting married, kind of all happened pretty quickly. But I felt peace in it, you know, my life now, I, I don't follow the rules that I was raised in because they're not biblical. You know, I, like I said earlier, I still believe in modesty and not living in extremes, but I just do my best to please God. I have a job that I love. I have a husband I love, a bonus son that I adore. I have friends that actually love me and we have a great relationship with each other. I've never felt God so close or like wanting to deepen my relationship with him even more. So I'm the happiest I've ever been. I told Richard all the time, like thinking back to how I felt all those years was just bondage and sadness and depression that I went through all the time. Honestly, um, I will also say like having to wear a skirt all the time was not fun for me and I always felt uncomfortable. I never felt like myself. I was never able to just kind of relax and feel like, oh, I can just dress comfortably today and like for the weather, like be warm in the winter or not, you know, burning up in the summer, like just to be able to be comfortable and feel just kind of like, just to be myself, you know, and not try to force myself into a box that's not me has been so freeing and refreshing in my life, honestly. Did they teach the prosperity gospel? Um, not that I really remember, honestly. It was never really about money. Um, I, I think, well, maybe in a different way that they would preach more so like, if you're not being healed from a sickness or something, there's a reason. There's a reason for that, like you're not praying hard enough or there are issues in your life that are hindering God from um, healing you. As if anything we could do would have the power to hinder God from doing what he actually wants to do. But there was kind of more like preachings like that, not so much about money. How have you dealt with people talking about you when you left and how did you know it was the Lord's will? Um, truthfully, it was very scary to leave. It was very scary to wear pants in public for the first time, to post wearing pants, to post cutting my hair or people to see I got my ears pierced or whatever. And it's easy to obsess over that when you leave. I think every person who leaves a denomination like this can relate to that. Um, it's going to be hard, you know, the first year seeing family members for the first time and I'm wearing pants, going to certain places and wearing pants, like you are so hyper aware of what you're wearing, what people are looking at, what they're saying. Um, but I promise you it gets so much easier. And at some point you just stop caring what people think. I think in Pentecostalism, they're really raising you to be people pleasers. So when you leave, they're kind of like just setting you up to like never backslide because you are going to be so worried about what people think about you. But I promise you, people's opinions is not worth you staying in like false preachings and living a life that's untrue um, and being far from God and not even living in his purpose. Um, and I knew it was God's will because I fe I'd felt it in my heart for a long time. Like I said, that I wanted to leave. And it wasn't until I left and started digging deeper into myself that I actually had a real relationship with him for the first time and felt his peace, felt his comfort, his healing in my life over these things. So it was like abundantly clear to me that this is what I was supposed to do. How did you mentally deal with people thinking you were backsliding? That just kind of goes along with the same thing I just said. Um, I don't care what people think, honestly. And if you're judging other people based off of them not believing the same as you and you think that they're going to hell for that then like you have deeper issues that you need to figure out because you're not the judge first off second off 
you don't need to be so consumed with other people's lives and thinking that you need to figure out who's going to heaven, who's going to hell. I live my life, hopefully in a way where people can see Jesus through me. And people have told me like, they have seen such a change in me since I left that I actually am kind and I am myself. I was so angry and bitter and depressed for majority, well, I mean, once I was a teenager and I started feeling those things, like I was so unhappy there. I'm the happiest I've ever been now. So let people have their opinions. If they think less lesser than of you, that's on them. And honestly, I don't really have a close relationship with people in my life if they think of me that way. Can you explain the reasoning behind not cutting your hair? You don't cut your hair because there's a verse, let me see what it is, 1 Corinthians 11 and 6 that says you shouldn't cut your hair. And also I was taught you shouldn't cut your hair because your hair is your glory, which is mentioned in verse 15 of that chapter. I can do a study on that if you guys like, but I just don't believe that when you read this verse in context, I don't believe that it applies to us today um, like Pentecostal people try to imply that it does. Wow, that was so long. I just filmed for like an hour. That's like the longest video of my life. <laughs> <sighs> that was a lot, guys. Um, thank you for sitting through it with me. Um, again, if you have any questions for me, leave it below. Let me know what videos you'd like to see based on this. Um, please be kind in the comments. If I see, you know, hateful, spiteful remarks, you're going to be removed. But... Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I appreciate you guys for watching. I love all, I love you all and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.